Are you showing about 50 people at the moment? Yes. Yeah. All right, you just give the sign when you're ready. Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Brad Pacheco with the CalPERS team and I'll be facilitating our discussion. This is the second education event in a series of events that we are doing about CalPERS asset liability management process. This work occurs every four years and culminates into a recommendation to the CalPERS board about the pension funds discount rate in the fall. I do wanna let you know that we are recording this webinar uh, so that we can make it available on our website for employer partners and stakeholders that could not be with us today. It's important to us that we answer any questions that you may have from this presentation. So we've allotted approximately 90 minutes for our time here together. If you do have a question, you can use the raise hand feature in Zoom, or you can type your question into the chat box. If we don't get to it right away, we'll make sure to answer your question at the end of our session. So I wanna introduce my colleagues that are joining me today. We have Michael Cohen, our Chief Financial Officer, Scott Tarando, our Chief Actuary, and Sterling Gunn, Managing Investment Director in our investment office. I'd like to kick it off uh, by asking Michael to walk us through the timeline of our ALM process, where we are currently and what members can uh, expect in the coming months. So Michael, I'll turn it over to you. Sure, uh, thanks Brad and good morning to everybody. Um, as Brad said, this is a once every four year uh, process and we sort of start slow and then things start ramping up uh, pretty quickly thereafter. And so we're just about to get into the period of time where things are gonna ramp up. So um, as you can see at the bottom, we are ho holding these quarterly webinars to keep everyone informed as things develop. So the next one is scheduled for the beginning of June. But in terms of actual events uh, dealing with uh, the ALM cycle, June, our board meeting will be the next main event where our investment office will be discussing capital market assumptions, which uh, Sterling will get into in more detail later. Then we move into July, where we have our traditional uh, offsite uh, for our board, where it's focused more on education. So we'll dive deeper into uh, the ALM process with them and what to expect going forward. And then by the time we get to September, uh, we're into uh, discussions of actual uh, investment portfolio options, as well as the draft of the experience study that comes from our actuarial office. And Scott Tranda will uh, go into detail uh, later uh, this morning on that. And all of this is really leading up to November when the board will make its uh, ALM decisions. So the two outputs uh, that are really critical on the ALM in terms of decision-making are uh, the uh, risk alloc the asset allocation of our investment strategy, and based on that um, way that we choose as a as a board and an organization to invest our money, we end up with a discount rate, and that discount rate really drives uh, what you as an employer see in terms of the funded ratio of your plan, as well as your annual costs of contributions to Calpers. Uh, so that's really the schedule um, between June and November. As you can see, there will be lots of uh, meetings. Uh, we really do uh, want and 
hope for a lot of engagement from our stakeholders. So in addition to um, all of our regular uh, public uh, meetings where uh, you're welcome to uh, make comments as well as send letters, we do have these quarterly webinars, as I mentioned, uh, provide input and, and feedback to us as well as make sure that you're fully aware of all of the uh, material that's coming before the board and that uh, you're able to participate to the fullest extent possible. Thanks, Michael. And let me just stay at the, at the top of the program here that, that this timeline that you're seeing on the screen, as well as the presentations that we've already provided to the board, uh, this webinar that's going to be recorded, all of that is posted on our website. We have a dedicated page on the ALM process. The easiest thing to do is go to the CalPERS website, just type in ALM in the search feature and all this material will come up. Um, so it's there available to you as a resource. Um, Michael, one of the questions that we often get asked is who's really making this decision around our discount rate? Uh, we have uh, the team that is putting together all this material. We have our 13 member board. Maybe you could talk a little bit about the, the roles uh, between the CalPERS team and the CalPERS board. Sure, uh, and this relationship isn't all that different from uh, sort of uh, city management and a city council or a board of supervisors. But really the CalPERS team, it has the sort of technical expertise to provide um, our board the most uh, current and best information. And ultimately that the board is the one who makes all of the decisions. That being said, obviously, um, the CalPERS team, you know, the offices that you're hearing from today um, have a great deal of expertise and utilize that expertise to provide uh, recommendations to the board. Uh, in addition to both of these entities, the board and, and the team, we do have a number of independent experts uh, that weigh in uh, throughout the process. So investment uh, experts, as well as governance expert, experts. So, um, Really, the, the thing that overlays both the board and the team dynamic is this fiduciary responsibility. Ultimately, um, the Constitution requires the pension fund to make sure that it's meeting all of its obligations uh, to its members. And so that's what all of this is designed to do, that the team makes the recommendations to the board, the board can review the, their options and make final decisions. And then from those final decisions, as you see on the slide, uh, we then go out and implement them. So whatever the uh, investment allocation decision is, our investment team goes and makes those decisions. Thanks, Michael. So let's dive into some of this content. I'm going to turn to Sterling. Uh, one of the key factors in uh, building this recommendation is the capital market assumptions that we look at. And Sterling, if you can just kind of describe how this process works, is it the CalPERS team that pulls this together, the consultants, some sort of combination? And when you think about assumptions, how far out can we predict uh, the market outcomes and, and is predict even the right word? Oh, well, thank you, Brett, for that question. Um, I'll start with the last question and then dig into the CMAs. So we're really not in the business of trying to predict. We're, we're really trying to be prepared for what could happen. And so our approach to the CMAs this year is an extension of what we've done in the past. And let me sort of give you a three-part answer. You know, what are the CMAs? Um, what, why do we need them? And uh, how do we estimate them? Um, so what they are is basically our best understanding of how the economy and the future mar financial markets might actually behave. And we, uh, when we do that, we're looking at you know, possible GDP, inflation, market returns, uh, asset risks, those kind of things. So that's what the, mac the market assumptions are about. And they ultimately will reflect uncertainty. Um, you know, if in, we think about, well, we want a discount rate. That's the, the thing we actually want out of all of this work. And the reality of things are uncertain. So we're gonna use the CMAs to explore the possible range of outcomes. Um, so it goes beyond just estimating the discount rate. It's about what's a good portfolio given the level of uncertainty that we're confronted with. So then the question is, well, how do we go about getting that? So you've raised a few um, interesting aspects. So one is we certainly do survey um, external managers um, whose opinions we value. And so they will reply to us, again, not just with expected returns, 
uh, but really rich analysis of how they think the world's likely to work, what will influence things in the future. Um, so they will also talk about the, you know, the economy and potential of financial markets. Internally, we do exactly the same thing. We develop our own view of the world as best we understand it. And again, we're looking at expected returns, we're looking at risk, uh, inflation and GDP. And if you think, you know, all of, all of us are, are experts in our area. And it's amazing how diverse opinions actually are, particularly at this moment in time and in history. Um, so it becomes on us to sort of say, okay, given this wide range of what's possible provided by both ourselves internally and those that are external, we ask ourselves, so what's probable? Um, and even the range of what's probable, you know, isn't a really sharp estimate of exactly what will happen. Um, so to sort of conclude here, the, you know, how we go about this, experts, including ourselves, and we develop this range of what's probable so that when we do our work, we're prepared to explore what could possibly happen. Yeah, Sterling, so I, um, as you've been talking about the board and, and the stakeholders in this process, you know, I heard you say risk. And I know in working with all of you, we often talk to the board about what level of risk uh, they are willing to accept in the portfolio. So if you could describe why that's important and how that risk translate into ultimately the asset allocation and discount rate that we, we choose. Right. Um, so we have multiple objectives. And so risk, you know, as, as one of our beliefs is multifaceted because uh, we are trying to manage the risk for each of those objectives. And just as a reminder, one objective is maximize returns. Um, and one is to minimize costs. Those two are obviously uh, related. Um, we're also supposed to try to minimize uh, risk of loss in the portfolio because that would impair our ability to, to deliver in the future if that risk was too high. Um, so if that's what risk is about, then finding the right level of risk is a little bit bespoke and it's something we will work with the board on, um, but it's a balancing of these various objectives and trying to strike the right balance given the circumstances that we are in. And striking that balance, again, I go back to, I mentioned in the CMAs about being prepared and about discussing what's possible, but what's also probable. So in terms of risk, you know, we're likely to you know, say, okay, well, here's, this is what probable looks like. And then we have to ask, well, these other things are possible and can we bear the consequences of what's possible? And if we can, then we can leave these kind of risks in the portfolio. Um, if we cannot, then we have to make sure those risks do not reside in the portfolio. So those are the nature of the, the balancing act we try to, to strike. Uh, what else might I say about risk? In terms of how much risk, um, an interesting thing about risk, uh, the more risk you take, although the reward for risk increases, it increases at a lower and lower rate. And there just comes a point where increasing risk uh, really doesn't justify the additional reward. And so what we will try to do is lay out then um, for the board, the different portfolio choices and an understanding of what that sort of risk return trade-off looks like. And at what point are we where risk really doesn't appear to be rewarded very well? So don't have an exact answer today. That's the work we have to do between now and September. So we have a clearer picture of those trade-offs. Thanks, Sterling. Uh, maybe just one last question, if I may. Mm -hmm. So I, I know that the discount rate will, will translate into uh, an asset allocation for the CalPERS fund. Mm -hmm. um, but even if the discount rate stays the same, uh, that's, we just don't put that on autopilot. Uh, we're constantly reviewing it, recalibrating it. Uh, maybe you can just talk about that process, how that's done, and how closely we stick to that asset allocation during those four years until the next review. Right, so the, the discount rate is closely tied to the expected returns, long-term returns on the portfolio. And so as we do our work here, first I'll go back to the conversation about risk. Um, you know, there's a threshold at which beyond which it's probably not worth taking risk and that kind of sets um, a bound then on what's really reasonable for the discount rate. I think an important observation is, uh, you know, 
views on the market change over time, expected market returns change over time. And so that does lead to the need to review the discount rate and ask, should we change that discount rate, which is exactly the purpose of this year's ALM, like it has been in the past. So we are actually in the midst of that process now. And again, I, I sound like a broken record, but I always come back to, it's about balancing risk and finding the best trade-off. If we look at what's happened in the last few years, um, in the market, expected returns have come down. They've come down quite a bit. At the same time, incumbent risks have gone up. And so we have some interesting work to do here in terms of striking probably what will look like a new balance between risk and return. And that will then lead to some recommendation uh, for the discount rate. All right, thanks, Sterling. And I know we've been talking about really your world, which is the, the A and the ALM, the assets. Uh, so I'd like to move to the L in ALM, which is the liabilities, uh, a, a very huge piece in this process. And I'll turn to Scott Tarando, our chief actuary. Scott, can you define for us what you look at uh, when we talk about the, a, the L and ALM, the, the demographic assumptions and the economic assumptions? Sure, Brad. Um, so when we talk about the actuarial assumptions, um, as you have um, illustrated here, there, there's you know, two big categories of assumptions that we look at, um, demographic and economic. On the demographic side, um, those are related to you know, the pension plans membership. And we look at future rates of like retirement, turnover and disability. And we also, another key um, assumption that we look at is, is the mortality, you know, the rate of death, both pre-retirement and post-retirement. And I think those are, are the main drivers on the demographic side. The economic side um, are other factors, you know, we look at um, things to consider investment return. We look at uh, inflation, payroll growth, and uh, the various pay increases among the inv individual plan participants, I would say fall under the economic assumption. But we also make um, some other minor assumptions um, like rate of marriage, um, the rate of benefit election, and, and you know, um, assumptions that you know, you know, have a minor impact on, on the results, but um, it's something we, we do look at and, and make adjustments as we go through our, our process every every um, four years. Um, Scott, the one thing I would oh, say, one ahead. thing to consider, um, our assumptions are, are, are mostly forward looking. Um, they're not, they're, they're, they're supposed to be estimates of future behavior. And we, we, we do look at historical information when we develop the rates but we also take in consideration you know, current trends as well as future projections and external conditions going on as we go through our process. Yeah, and Scott, do you think that uh, one of these sets of assumptions has a bigger impact on pension costs over the other? Oh, um, definitely, I would say the economic assumptions do. Um, when, when, you, when you think about you know, the size of CalPERS, um, and the size of our membership, we, we have a lot of um, exposure and experience available to us that, that provide us with the ability to set um, rates that remain fairly consistent in our approach um, versus you know, what you would have with smaller plans where you have, um, I think, the larger fluctuations. If you look at um, some of the gain losses that we've had over the last several years, what, we're, what we find is about 85% of the overall experience gains and losses are coming from the investment side. Um, you know, to kind of put some more numbers around that, um, we, we see that over the last seven or eight years, you know, the investment losses have averaged, you know, basically looks like around 0.3% of the assets. You know, it's a small number, but even Put that in perspective, that 0.3% of assets has the fluctuation that you're seeing in terms of contribution rates. You know, um, the liabilities you know, are around five, five or six times smaller. So you're looking at 0.05%, 0.06% of the liabilities. So really small numbers on, generally on, on, the, on the liability side. Um, every once in a while, we will have um, 
an adjustment on the um, demographic side. Um, it, for those of you who've been around for a while, we, we had a um, fairly substantial adjustment on the mortality around eight years ago, 10 years ago, where we made um, some adjustments on how our process reflected projections of the, of the um, um, mortality improvement. And that had a, a, a large one-time increase. But for the most part, um, as I mentioned, you know, the assets, the gain loss around the assets are driving the big volatility that you're, you're seeing in the uh, yearly contribution piece. And Scott, so we've talked about demographic assumptions, economic assumptions. I heard you talk about lifespan, mortality. Um, I know you put together an experience study. So for the audience, if you could just describe what that study is and how it contributes to this work. Uh, sure. So every four years, you know, as part of the um, ALM process, um, the actual office conducts a experience study. And, you know, in very simply, you know, the experience study is a process by which the actuaries develop the new assumptions or exist, existing assumptions for the pension plan, um, on both the demographic and the economic side. Um, we go through and we re review the data, we look at emerging trends, and, and we look at future expectations. Um, for CalPERS, um, you know, we have a number of plans um, that we break into, you know, we, that we look at separately. We, we um, you know, we develop rates separately based on mis whether you're miscellaneous, safety, police, and fire. Um, and we look at a combination of experience, not only um, recent trends and what's been happening, but we go back um, 10, 15 years to, to see what's, um, what's available and what kind of um, experience the plan is, is seeing. Um, we look at you know, what we expected, um, what's happening. And then we also compare it to you know, national um, experience throughout the country. Um, you know, if, if we don't have a large amount of data to support our numbers, um, you know, it, the, the information is not credible. And so we have to kind of wait, you know, what, what we're seeing with CalPERS versus national um, experience, where, where um, a larger number of plans have contributed to a database and, and we can see national trends in, in terms of retirement, uh, mortality, and, and other decrements throughout throughout the system. Um, we have um, actual standards that are out there and they kind of um, guide us in how we, we approach our review of the, the um, decrements. And we also are, are required to make sure that those ex, um, assumptions are reasonable. Um, the, the impact, they have an impact on contributions, rates, and, and, and overall sustainability of the plan. And we need to make sure that those rates are a reasonable reflection of what the plan is experiencing. Yes, yeah, Scott, um, thank you. I wanna ask, cause I, I think that it's something that our attendees will probably be wondering as well, that I'm wondering, uh, we've had a very challenging last 12 months. Uh, the US recently passed 500,000 deaths from COVID-19. And many are worried that there may be long-term health impacts for those who had COVID and lived, including potentially shortened lifespans. So when you are putting together your experience study, do you have a sense of the impact of COVID long-term on CalPERS, whether it's uh, life expense expectancy or even disability retirement rates? Okay, well, um, for this, um... ALM cycle, our experience study will be based on data up through 6-30-2019. Um, that's the last um, full data set that we had available to us. So obviously um, COVID-19 won't be included in those results. So um, any, any type of rates that we develop um, won't have COVID-19 in it. Um, what we're seeing short term though, um, we're seeing a little bit of higher mortality, especially in some of the older ages. And depending on um, some groups, we're seeing a little bit higher retirement rates. Um, I think a number of people have seen 
that there's a, a even though teachers aren't in our system, um, there's been a higher number of teachers that have been retiring in the last year. So, you know, when, you know these are short-term impacts. When we do our experience today, we're looking for longer trends. And, you know, when we do our, our next experience study, the experience this year will, will be um, included in it, but it'll also include, you know, the, the following several years that occur after it. And so any you know, short-term fluctuations that may have occurred because of COVID in terms of you know, spikes of either mortality or retirement may subsequently drop in the following years because it just kind of moved that experience up, up a couple of years. So, you know, when we look at, you know, we, we, only, we don't look at one year when we set our, our expectations, we look at uh, several years and we look at trends. Long-term, I, I think, you know, right now it's unknown. Um, four years from now, when we do the next ALM cycle, you know, we'll, we'll have several years worth of data to look over and we'll, we'll make a, a better call on whether we see if there's a longer term impact or whether it was just a, a short term bump in experience. All right, Scott, thank you. I, we do have a question. Uh, I believe it's from Mr. Lee about inflation. Uh, Mr. Lee, if you wanna unmute yourself, uh, please go ahead and ask your question. Great, thank you. Good morning, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can, thank you. Thanks uh, for the opportunity to ask the question. Uh, so when I look at the actuarial valuation, uh, CalPERS current assumption for inflation is two and a half percent. And what I'm seeing is, you know, for the current experience, yes, we may get, you know, close to that or, or even exceed that. But in the long term, you know, looking at the FOMC, they're anticipating, you know, after that, you know, sub 2%, even close to 1%. So I'm just curious, when I looked at the um, pension um, outlook tool, there is no input for modeling um, changes to that <clears throat> assumption. Is that something that's on the horizon? And then two, if that were um, CalPERS, uh, if there were a change to that, um, what would that look like for our unfunded pension liability? Thanks. I'm sure. So I'll try and cover um, a, a number of those questions for you. Um, yeah, we are, uh, as part of the, the um, process, we do look at inflation um, and you know, you know, we, we, we wanna be careful with inflation. That's, that's a long-term inflation. Um, right now it is 2.5, um, you know, and you know, you know, if you look at recent inflation, it had been you know, you know, like you said, expectations were around 2%, a little bit below 2%. Um, but if you look at what's going on right now, there's going to be, it looks like short-term inflation is, is spiking. So you, you, you do have um, a lot of fluctuation on, on the um, inflation side that we're, we're trying to take a long-term approach on. Um, but we are going to be looking at inflation, um, you know, and obviously, you know, the Fed, Fed's expectations in terms of, you know, their long-term goal is 2%. So, you know, um, we're, looking, we're looking at um, Fed expectations, we look at Social Security Administration and where the, their views are on long-term inflation as well. For pension outlook, yes, we know um, the liability, the projections don't include inflation. Um, I, I think that would be a, a goal for ours to get inflation in there. Um, the challenge with inflation is that, you know, when, when you... you um, make an adjustment or you make variations on the investment income. Um, you, you, you can run out the liabilities and then you can model the, the impact on the assets. When you change inflation, that has an impact on the liabilities. And so we have to remodel the liabilities. So it's a little bit more involved when you change inflation, you have to, actually, you, you have to also make an, an adjustment, not only on your expected return on assets, but also your your um, expected cash flows on your liability side. It's more involved. Um, yes, it would be a goal for ours to try and get it out there. Um, we're working on it, but uh, it's definitely a little bit more challenging, but you know, that would be um, something we would um, like to get out there. In terms of impact on um, your, your funded status and contributions, if, if you think about it, if you, if you, if you drop inflation, you're generally would be dropping your discount rate at the same time. 
because your expectations going forward are, are coming down, you know, inflation expected returns are usually based upon um, yeah, inflation, risk, and real return. And you build those, those up in terms of your expectations. And, you know, you, Sterling could probably give you a way better and more detailed explanation. But you have inflation underlying all your expected returns. And if you bring your inflation down, you're going to be expect, bringing your um, expected returns down as well. Now, it's not as um, a big of a decrease or not a big of a decrease in funded status or increase in contributions if you bring inflation down. And at the same time, you bring your discount rate down because you're keeping your real rate of return the same. Um, when you bring your real rate of return down, that actually has, that has a bigger impact on contributions and funded status. But if you bring your inflation down, your, your rates would, would correspondingly um, it'd be expected to go up. Thanks, Scott. So just as a reminder to everyone, if, if you do have a question, you can use the raise uh, hand feature in Zoom or type it into uh, the chat box. Uh, so I want to move back to the asset side of the house, uh, back to Sterling. And, uh, you know, the long-term sustainability of CalPERS is, is largely dependent on investment returns. And we know that that's a challenge for us in helping to hit that goal. So Sterling, I was hoping that you could just address how well positioned we are in uh, achieving our investment targets and what are our advantages in strengths uh, that CalPERS has um, to meet uh, the long-term horizon? Um, so let's start with, with our advantages first, then we can talk a bit about um, what this looks like going forward. Um, so we have sort of two types of, of advantages, um, inherent advantages, uh, which just come with being a fund with a large amount of assets, um, large fund that has capital that isn't going to go anywhere, right? We know that it's going to be here to pay future liabilities. So it's not like a money market fund where stuff can flow into and out of it all the time. Um, so our, our capital is committed um, for a significant period of time. And that allows us to be a long-term investor. So that's just inherent with being a large fund with very stable uh, we have some developed advantages as well. Um, we have a, a professional skilled investment team uh, managing the portfolio uh, with a wide range of activities. They do it very well from managing liquidity on a short horizon up to managing the overall uh, portfolio risks. And we also have teams focused on trying to add value, whether it's in private debt or private equity, uh, fixed income over and above just the returns that we would uh, get from just passively investing in the marketplace. Um, another developed uh, capability for ours is our governance structure, where we're uh, focused on managing the portfolio as a total portfolio. That allows us to find you know, some modest synergies and to better understand the total risk in the portfolio. That's quite distinct from if we just had asset classes and if the asset classes really didn't talk to each other and if we didn't manage them in a holistic way, then there's a good chance one could misunderstand the total risks that actually drive the plan performance. Um, so having said that, then obviously we want to take advantage of these things, these comparative advantages uh, to help build a diversified portfolio with good returns, um, having acceptable risks. And again, I go back to my conversation about acceptable risk. Um, so to date, you know, over a lo uh, you know, long period of time, um, we have been sort of hit hitting the mark on expected returns for the portfolio. Uh, in any one year, it's really hard to say, because frankly, uh, returns are somewhat capricious. So you can have great years and you can have poor years. And the really important thing is to be focused on the longer term. Uh, so going forward, um, will we hit the target? I'm confident that we will. The real question will remain, we had talked about CMAs earlier and we talked about discount rate earlier, is might the target change over time? And the answer to that question is probably yes, because it is tightly linked to what's actually expected in the marketplace. Thanks, Sterling. So 
Uh, with respect to the discount rate, uh, we know that CalPERS has lowered the rate uh, over time, um, currently at 7%. And during the last process, we uh, did a phase in of the lowering of the rate to help mm -hmm. mitigate the impact to employers on their budget. So Scott, uh, if I could ask if, and I say if the discount rate were to be lowered, uh, what would be the team's recommendation uh, about phasing in the rate over a number of years as was done in, in 2017? Hi, Brad. So, um, yeah, you know, when we talk about phase in, um, you know, we, need, we need to keep in mind that, you know, you know currently um, any change in the discount rate would be amortized over 20 years. Um, that's our standard amortization policy. So, um, we, there's already, you know, technically when you think about it, it's a 20 year phase in of a change in the end funded because, you know, we're amortizing the difference over 20 years. Um, if um, the board is um, thinking about an additional phase in, we, we, we could, you know, it kind of depends on the final choice. Um, you know, it depends on, you know, the asset allocation and the impact on employer costs, you know, stakeholder input as well in terms of whether they feel an, um, a phase in would be something they would be interested in. But, you know, we could definitely present um, various options to the board in terms of phase in. I think the key, key thing to keep in mind is any phase in basically is just going to increase costs. Um, it's just like, you know, additional interest payments, you're, you're deferring the payment. And, and so when we look at, you know, phase in options, you know, it's, it's a balance between, you know, increased costs versus trying to smooth those costs in over, over a reasonable time to kind of um, tamper down um, large fluctuations in, or increases that employers may be facing. So, you know, when we look at that, it, it, you know, we're trying to balance those two items out, but any, just, you know, keep, just keep in mind, any, any deferral of payments is just increasing costs. And so, you know, you're increasing costs to save costs. It, it kind of you know, defeats the purpose of that. Thanks, yeah. Scott. Sure. So I have to ask here, uh, I mean, you are the, the three of you are the experts. So this question is really for, for any of you. Um, discount rates currently 7%. Uh, we are sitting here uh, at probably a 15% return with two months, two months left in the end of the fiscal year. Um, you've signaled in some of the presentations to our board already that it's gonna be a challenge to even hit 7% in the coming year. So square something away with me here. 7%, uh, 15%, it doesn't seem like we have an issue here. I'll take a shot at this one. Um, I think the 15% this year is a little bit like when you're going through a walk in the park and you come across a $20 bill. Um, happy to get it. It's not something I count on every day. The same thing is true of 15%. It's great and we should, you know, we seize an opportunity by participating in a very good market. Doesn't mean that's going to happen every year. In fact, it's very unlikely that it will happen every year. Scott, Michael, any other thoughts? Yeah, I think just to echo that thought that when we talk about volatility in our investment portfolio, 15% is one of the outputs of that volatility. So just like, you know, you can have a zero or a sub 7% return on any given year, you're going to see these sort of double digit returns. And, you know, obviously we're very excited and it keeps uh, the cost down, but it's really not a forecast of, of the future. So it's, um, you know, it's, we'll, we'll happily put the money in the bank, but uh, it doesn't really change the long-term uh, projection of what we expect to see over the coming decade or two decades. All right. Well, we hope it holds uh, for another couple months, definitely. Um, Scott, I'm going to go back to you because Many of the attendees on this webinar represent our employers, the cities, school districts, counties, and other local government uh, who employ our members. And uh, 
I understand there's a need to balance the assets and liabilities, but the bottom line is anything we do is going to impact their budgets and the contributions they have to make on pensions. So can you talk to us about the impacts the rate of return and the discount rate has on them and the system as a whole? Sure. So um, what we have um, here, the slide, this is um, one of the, um, a couple of charts that was in our funding levels and risk report that was um, published last November. And, and you know, I, I think what you can take from this chart is, you know, if you look at it, um, you know, you have like that center line and it talks about, it looks like per funded status, if we get, if we get our 7%. And also you can look at, you know, average contribution rates for safety and the miscellaneous plans kind of going up and then coming back down. And this is based on the 7%. What we, you can see is just if, if you look at just on the, the if the um, in expected inflate, uh, inflation investment return is either 8% or 7 or 6%, you can see what a large impact that has on funded status over the next 10 years. You can see, you know, it has around 6% impact on the funded status and it impacts contributions around 12% um, relative to the um, rate if we got the 7%. And I, the point is that there, this is just on the investment side. If, if you look at liability side, um, there's even more um, volatility that happens if you change the discount rate. I, I think, you know, we, we, we provided the pension outlook as a, a, a tool for employers to go out and, and see, you know, what kind of impact a rate would have or a rate, a discount rate change would have or expected returns would have on their particular plan. And I think that's, you know, I can talk about generalities here. Um, I would suggest employers go out and play around with that tool to get, you know, a better picture and, and, and a better projection on where things would be using that tool. Now, I think it was mentioned earlier, question that that tool doesn't allow you to change um, inflation. And so if you, if for example, I'm just going to think really, really big numbers here to make make it um, make it easy. If you drop the discount rate to six percent, that would be a six percent discount rate with a two and a half percent inflation. Um, if you were to, um, if we were to drop inflation at the same time we were dropping the discount rate, um, those costs would be you know a little bit less than would be less than that. So so you you have to you'd have to kind of play around with um, not going as far on the discount rate, maybe half, halfway. So, so say if you want to make some estimate of where a six and a half with a two and a quarter discount rate would be is maybe run it at say the six, seven, five number as a very, very rough approximation because we can't change inflation in that example. Um, there's just a lot of moving parts. You know, you're talking about inflation, you're talking about discount rate, you're talking about the asset allocation, the level of risk that the board's taking. And, you know, all these variables, um, you know, we'll, we'll, in September, you know, we'll, we'll be bringing choices to the board in terms of, of you know, what, what we feel is, you know, valid or, and, and recommending com combinations of all these. Um, but the challenge right now is, is just there's a lot of just different variables that each one can ha have an impact on, on the results. All right, thanks, Scott. We do have another question. Um, if I pitch it to any of the three of you, and that's uh, about CalPERS discount rate. Do you know where we sit if you look across the country at other pension funds or even globally? Uh, where does our discount rate sit? Is, is it high? Is it low? Is it kind of average in the nation? I, I would say we're middle of the pack, maybe a little bit, um, possibly on the, a little bit higher than, than, than the mean or median. 
and and I, I think it's just, it's just because it's because of the timing of everything. When you think about we last did our ALM process four years ago, and as Shirley mentioned, expected returns have have you know ratcheted their way down over the last several years. So anyone who's done um, a review of their discount rate asset allocation more recently than CalPERS would likely have or could be looking at possibly lower rates just because they've done it more recently. Um, I, um, some of the bigger plans, um, you know, there, there are a number of plans out there with um, expected returns lower than CalPERS. There's, there's a number of plans, um, same, same as us. Um, I think CalSERS is still at uh, 7%, but you know, if, if, if you look, there's some plans out I think the North Carolina system recently dropped their their expected returns to six and a half. I think the UC system's below seven percent as well. It it depends on what their asset allocation is too, and and the, the level of risk that their board's willing to take. You know, you know um, just the level of equities in the portfolio uh, and versus. Um, Fixed income is a key driver, and what a reasonable discount rate would be, you know, in this environment versus, say, what it was, say, four years ago. All right. Thank you, Scott. Um, one of the things that you mentioned was the tool that we have on our website uh, that allows employers to to put in some of their numbers and look at the impacts on their budget and. And that was, we built that largely in response to uh, employer requests to give them tools to help uh, plan and predict uh, the future. And uh, one of the other uh, tools, I guess, if you will, uh, that employers have expressed interest in having is uh, what we have termed a, a split fund or essentially a investment mix that's specific to their own plan. Um, and so Michael, if I could, if you could just talk to us a little bit about this uh, split fund concept and, and what it would take for CalPERS to do this and uh, how would it work? Sure. Um, so to back up to the beginning, this really, we have been looking at this, as you mentioned, in response to employer request. And it's a good reminder that uh, in a state as large as California, you always have uh, employers in incredibly different positions. So um, over the last couple of years, we have seen a number of employers struggling uh, financially, while others have really put an emphasis on paying down their pension obligations uh, to the greatest extent possible. And that's come through uh, a sort of a rise in the use of pension obligation bonds or just you know, discretionary uh, additional payments on top of their required annual contributions. Both of those mechanisms sort of raising um, a plan's funded status, you know, overall were at about 70%, um, but you've got other, you know, jurisdictions who have issued these bonds or made extra payments that are sort of approaching 100% above 90%. And so they've really, as we've talked about, our investment strategy does leave lead to quite a bit of volatility and is fairly aggressive. And so they've sort of you know, raised the question, well, if I'm up at you know, 95% funded, I don't really want to have this level of volatility. I got up there so that I wouldn't have unfunded liability and would like to reduce the chances of creating new unfunded liabilities. And so could my you know, plan be in a more conservative investment portfolio? And so that's sort of underlying the concept and the question that we've been looking at these last several months. And we have sort of committed to providing updates on, um, on you know, this concept at these uh, individual webinars. So that's sort of the background uh, really. And then the answer to your question of, could we do it? Uh, we've looked enough to say, yes, we could. Um, we haven't found any sort of fatal flaws with the concept. That being said, it would take a tremendous amount of effort on the side of CalPERS. And so uh, we've looked at it enough to think we, in all likelihood, we would need to go to the legislature to get authorization for this concept. So that would you know, obviously take some time, but it would coincide with the amount of time we would need to get operationally up and running. And probably the core 
issue that we still need to solve is how do you split up all of, you know, if a plan's been in CalPERS for years, how do you sort of split up those fixed assets that are in their plan sort of implicitly? Um, and going forward, how do you sort of, you know, equitably share investments, uh, you know, assets so that one plan is not sort of disproportionately benefiting from an investment uh, by choosing to go into this uh, more conservative uh, investment portfolio. So that's kind of the short answer. Um, but to move forward, there's obviously going to be some degree of uh, administrative costs to uh, implement this. And so, you know, we, we're getting to the point where we would really need um, not necessarily a large number of jurisdictions, but enough jurisdictions with enough sort of assets on, you know, on their side to make this worthwhile for all of those participating. So as we sort of get towards the summer, we would really need uh, some jurisdictions to approach us to say, yes, we've talked to our, our you know, city council or our board of supervisors or governing body, and we are very serious about this. You know, we wouldn't ask for a commitment, but we would want some sort of you know, serious uh, interest in it to sort of go to the next step. And to be fair, that's a really hard uh, decision to make uh, for a jurisdiction right now. As we've been talking about just today, we've got sort of lots of moving parts. We have inflation assumptions. We have, um, you know, the that for any given uh, investment strategy, it's getting harder and harder to get returns. And so to be fair, um, you know, you would need as a jurisdiction to really use that pension outlook tool and play around with it to see, okay, you know, how high would I be comfortable with my annual fixed costs to be, you know, in, in order to uh, sort of move forward with this concept. And uh, pension outlook tool is probably the best way to do that. It doesn't cover everything, but it would give you really a, a nice sense of, okay, those are my certain costs by lowering the discount, right? And ultimately this is sort of a, um, a jurisdiction choosing to lower its discount rate so that it automatically is going to face higher costs. But the trade-off as the slide shows would presumably be less volatility. So um, if that's something that any of our uh, you know, watchers uh, today are interested in and want to get more serious about it, certainly uh, you can approach me or uh, stakeholder relations would be uh, the best place to go to uh, continue the discussion in more detail. All right, thanks, Michael. So uh, I know we've covered a lot of material. We have a couple more slides, but I just wanted to say that you know now is the time. If you have a question, uh, as a reminder, use the raise hand feature or put it in the chat box as we're wrapping up. Uh, we've got our three experts here and uh, really would encourage you to utilize the opportunity to, to ask any questions that you may have. So if we jump to the next slide, I just wanna remind everyone uh, about the timeline that Michael covered at the beginning of the program. Um, we encourage participation and public comment at, at any and all of the board meetings that's, uh, that are scheduled to, to occur over the next couple months. Um, and uh, we continue, or we encourage you to continue to reach out to us and, and communicate with uh, any questions that you may have as we go through this process. Um, as I mentioned at the top of the program, we do have a dedicated page on our website uh, about the asset liability management process. Type in ALM in the search feature and this will pop up. It has all the board presentations. This webcast that we're doing right now is being recorded. We'll put that up on uh, the website. Uh, a lot of archived resources out there. And I, and I will mention, it just happened to be timely, there's a, a online uh, periodical newsletter, if you will, called top1000funds.com. And uh, our CEO, Marcy Frost, uh, sat down with um, the reporter with this uh, uh, newsletter and talked about the asset liability management process and some of the challenges. Uh, and uh, you'll hear a lot what was said today, but I'd encourage you to go out and take a look at that. And we'll, we'll add that also to uh, our dedicated ALM page. So with that, um, I am looking for any questions and I see one from 
Alexander, if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question. Let's see, Alexander, are you still there? I see a raised hand. And maybe David, you can unmute him. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go right ahead. We can hear you, Alexander. Alexander, go ahead and speak. We can hear you. Hey, I'm uh, having a hard time hearing everybody for some reason. Um, did you guys accept my hand raising? Yeah, it looks like it is. Okay, cool. Um, I'll just ask my question and hopefully this uh, sound will work itself out. Uh, first of all, thanks for the opportunity to ask a question. Um, my name is Alex Vandewark. I'm actually a firefighter paramedic for Vacaville City. So um, I appreciate you guys catering to multiple different audiences here. And so my, my kind of job here is to do as much uh, understanding as I can and take it back to my members as a union member and kind of educate people on where things are, where things are going. And uh, I'm kind of the one finance nerd in the group. So um, I, uh, I had two main questions after just wanting to make sure I, I said thank you to all you guys for all this great information. Um, the first one was about CMAs and understanding like the exact specific things that you guys are um, assuming for the near-ish or even long-term future. And then I would like to ask a little bit about the inflation we keep getting this figure thrown around that that inflation is two ish percent. And um, I just don't get it. I mean, we could start there if we want, um, but I feel like the, uh, you know, I don't know if we're using C CPI or what kind of metrics, but it seems to me just, and I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist here, but it seems to me by just looking around and listening to interviews and, and, and kind of doing my own research that how is it possible that we could have such a low inflation rate in a time where we're doing all this money printing and where fractional reserve credit issuing is through the roof and, and so on and so forth, you know, asset prices are through the roof. So, so what, how are we arriving at this 2% inflation rate? Um, and then I'll, I'll finish my CMA question, I guess, afterwards. All right. Thanks, Alexander. I'm, I'm hoping you can hear us. So I can I'll... now. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So we'll pitch to either Sterling or Scott on inflation. Let me let me start and then uh, Scott can pick up the pieces. I think um, one reason for the inflation being where it is, it, it's very challenging times, um, both in terms of policy and the economy. And, and I think also the other thing is like when you look forward 20 and 30 and 40 years, there's a huge demographic shift happening. Um, there's also a huge change in productivity happening. So I think overall, I mean, when you, when you talk to the economists that are doing this work, those are sort of key drivers. And it's hard to find an economist at the moment that would tell you inflation would be much different than that 2%. And by much different, I mean, I haven't heard anyone saying 4% or 5%. Um, the other thing, of course, is, and this is to your, your, your point, I think, Alex, as well, that inflation is, is a bit of a creature of policy in terms of what are central banks doing what are governments doing around fiscal policy? And so in the short term, you might get a very sort of a stimulus package that comes in and might spike inflation a little bit in the upfront. But again, over the long run, which is what we're looking at, um, the long-term fundamentals kind of indicate to us that inflation is not going to be much different than what we've been saying. Scott, you want to jump in and add? Um, yeah, thanks, Sterling. Um, you know, the kind of follow up on, on, on Sterling's point, you know, our, 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 the challenge that we have is, is taking a, a long term view and, and um, kind of balancing the various viewpoints that, that um, people have. Um, as, you know, you expressed, you know, the large recent inflation um, and, and, you know, I, I, would, I, would, I would, you know, echo what you said in, in recently, you're seeing spikes in um, food prices, commodity prices. A, a number of, of of spikes are happening right now. Um, we also remember. I also got asked the same question, and someone said the exact opposite. How can I have my inflation set so high at two and a half? Is shouldn't it be well below two? So, you know, 
number of people who have different views. Um, you know, some people are looking at, at one set of information and other people looking at another set of information. And, and what we're, we're, we try to do is we try, try and look at, you know, you know the, the economics around it and we try and take a long-term view towards it. Um, it's Sterling mentioned it's policy driven and, and we kind of try to look towards the Fed in terms of where we are in terms of policy and, and where we see things. Um, we, you know, our current inflation is two and a half, um, which would be high by some standards and, and low by other, um, low in, in recent month standards. So, so what we do is we, we're, we're trying to balance that out in terms of a long-term expectation. Um, and we try and, if, if we make changes in that, we want to make changes um, slowly. Um, what we, one thing we want to avoid is we don't want to drop inflation one year and then four years later turn around and, and bring it back up because expectations have changed. So we, we want you know, take a measured approach when we look at these things. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, it's not, you know, it's always a, a challenge with, with that um, assumption. And, and in some respect, it's, it's somewhat harder than, than the, the CMAs because it's, it's a lot more subjective, I would say. So hopefully that answers your question. And then I think yeah. Sterling could help you on the, um, more on the CMAs, I, I, would, I would defer to him on that one. Okay. Well, thank you, Sterling and Scott, for that. It did help answer my question, so I appreciate that very much. Yeah, just one uh, additional piece here. Um, you know, I spoke earlier about uncertainty, mm -hmm. and so the way we do approach that is we do have multiple scenarios, and each scenario does have its own assumption about GDP growth, about inflation, and about returns. Um, so it's we do at least at try to understand the sensitivity to these assumptions. So we have a baseline scenario, we have an upside and a downside. Um, so we can sort of see um, the consequences of having made a choice. If the world plays out differently, we at least are prepared and have some understanding for what can happen. Sterling, can I, can I ask you specifically regarding CMAs? I think what my members are mostly asking me, what is the downside CMA? I mean, they don't use it in that term, but they, they're asking, hey, what's the worst case scenario and how's PERS prepared? And so could you just maybe shed some specific light if it's, I don't know if you guys are able to talk about it, but I sure would love to take something back to them and say, look, this is how they've projected what could happen on the downside CMA. And this, and um, so anyway, if, if you don't mind sharing that, I'd really appreciate it. Um, so the work's incomplete. So I, 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 and I will share some information with you, but um, uh, when we've done our survey, uh, the, the median CMA at the moment is below 6% with the current portfolio. So if we were to not change the portfolio, then the survey that we took across the, the various managers um, suggests that the portfolio would get less than a 6% return over the long run. Um, so that's, that's something we're aware of, you know, the, the range. Um, I, you know, I, I'd like to talk about the ranges right now in, in part because <laughs> you, know, you can almost always find someone to give, you, give us the answer that we want, right? If we want a really high return or a really low return. Sure. But I can tell you that, you know, the range is, is fairly wide. You know, it's like plus or minus a, a percentage point anyway. Um, and, you're, and you still have tails out farther than that. So a fundamental question then becomes, um, that offers a bookend. If we, if we just kept the current portfolio, then the median expected return from the survey is less than 6%. On the other hand, we might say, well, okay, what, is, what do we gain by increasing risk? And risk isn't just about the portfolio, right? You know, Scott mentioned volatility of contributions. We can talk about what the potential of, for impairing the uh, uh, funding ratio as well. So if we take too much risk, uh, at some point risk, taking additional risk are not really rewarded for the additional risk because it, it tails off. So we have to explore what additional risk might look like and what we gain from taking additional risk. Um, and that's the work that we will do. You know, we'll share the CMAs in June. So you'll get a more robust answer than you're getting from me now. I'm just trying not to, to prejudge the work. And then based on that work, 
come September, we will see uh, candidate portfolios, which will have <laughs> distinct levels of risk and associated with that, you know, discount rates and implications for contribution rates and for the funding ratio and so on. Um, and that's that timeline that uh, Brad and, and Michael have spoken to a few times today. Is that helpful? Awesome. Yeah, it is very helpful. Thank you. I think the, the main thing that I'm trying to um, ascertain is what in your guys' projections on your team, the board, what is the worst case scenario? Not really with the discount rate per se, as much as like the overall status of <laughs> our our total portfolio. You know, like I know I'm not I'm not gonna say like what's the doomsday kind of prediction, but but that's kind of what I'm you know for lack of a better term. What is there something that you guys have defined in some way that depicts a uh, a possible scenario in which you know we might be Kentucky? Does that help kind of specifically ask what I'm? Todd, maybe you can address the report that you put together that looks at the, um, that looks at the probabilities of falling under different funded statuses. That probably would be the closest, I think, to, to answering this question. Yeah, and if I can add a comment um, on Kentucky, um, I don't know the history of Kentucky, but Kentucky was um, very poorly funded. And, and when they were looking at dropping the discount rate, I mean, they were well below 50%. And then I think they're in the 30s now, I'm not sure. Um, and I'm not sure they're make, they were required they were making the required contributions to bring up their funded staff. So there, were, there were a lot of issues around Kentucky. So, um, you know, just keep that in mind in terms of, you know, even, you know, um, with the, um, a lower funded status, it, it's, you know, we're, we're, we're hovering around 70% right now. Um, um, well, well above the, you know, where, where um, Kentucky is at the, at the lower amounts. So, um, you know, just that. that's something to keep in mind as well. You know, um, New Jersey, Illinois, you know, all, Kentucky, the plans that you hear in, in the news with the really low funded statuses, they don't make their annual required contribution. So, so you know, they're, they're told, here's what the contribution is to keep the plan funded. And they're not even making that contribution. They make some of, you know, they make what they want to make towards the, the contribution. And obviously what's happened is over the years, the funded status has, has you know, decreased year over year as, as they put less money into it. Um, and, and that's, I, I think, been the big driver for why those systems are where they are today. Thank you for that comparison. I appreciate it. All right, thanks, uh, Alexander. We appreciate you being here on, on behalf of your members. Uh, gentlemen, we do have one other question and that's uh, about uh, our risk mitigation policy that was put in place by our board uh, several years ago, I think it was. And uh, is that still in place? And if we did hit the 15% that we talked about earlier, what would happen to the discount rate? Sure, uh, let me take uh, that, that one, Brad. Uh, yes, it's uh, in place. It was suspended for several years while the discount rate was being uh, implemented, the, the lowering of the discount rate. But at, say, 15%, it's 0.1% uh, reduction, so from 7 to 6.9%. So uh, that would be the case. The trigger from 0.1 to 0.05 is at 14%. So we're, we're right about you know, that between 0.05 and 0.1% reduction. All right, thanks, Michael. Um, I'll just ask one last time if there's any other questions. Again, just use the raise the hand feature or type it into the chat box. Hi, Brad, it's David Descartes, CalPERS. There are a couple of questions that came in. Um, it's just difficult to get them over to you. Um, so I'll just articulate one, okay? So one, one question that came in was about pension obligation bonds. Uh, so probably for Michael, um, does CalPERS have a position on that? Do, is it generally kind of a positive for CalPERS for an agency to take out a pension obligation bond? Um, and, and 
what's our kind of overall thoughts on that? Sure. Uh, thanks, David. Uh, CalPERS does not have a position on pension obligation bonds one way or the other. They obviously are very complicated uh, financing tools. And so, you know, we would just hope that for any jurisdiction uh, looking at them, that you sort of do your due diligence and understand all of the risks associated with them, uh, have various scenarios. Ultimately, from a pension fund standpoint, of course, we're happy to uh, have the extra funds. Your plan's uh, funded ratio will go up, but we're also concerned about your long-term sustainability and your ability to make annual payments uh, you know, long into the future. So those are sort of the way we look at them. You have a balancing act of you know, short-term benefit clearly, but then we would just want to make sure that an issuing jurisdiction understands uh, the risks of, um, uh, of making those so that they make an informed uh, decision. It is another place, another opportunity to plug the pension outlook tool. While it's not specifically designed to sort of model pension bonds, there is, you can sort of uh, plug in a discretionary payment into the model. And then you, obviously you would have to track your, uh, your debt payments on, on the bond issuance uh, somewhat separately, but uh, you know, your, your actuary could help you kind of uh, figure out how, how to operate that. Um, but I think that covers the, the basic landscape of pension bonds. Very good, thank you. There's another question that came in. This one's probably more for Scott. So Scott, can you kind of describe what's the relationship between the discount rate and how the unfunded liabilities for agencies are calculated. So if meaning specifically here, if we were to lower the discount rate, is there just a, a certain percentage increase directly that happens with the UAL? Can you just kind of elaborate on the relationship between those two numbers? Okay, sure. So um, when, when um, there's a change to the discount rate, um, your, your, your accrued liabilities change. And, that, and um, you know, let's step back a minute and, and, and remember that um, the unfunded liability is basically the accrued liability, my, liabilities minus assets. And what happens is, is when there's a, a change to, to the discount rate, there would be a corresponding change to the accrued liability. Your asset number wouldn't change. And so basically, if your liabilities go up, your unfunded liability goes up. Um, and so it, it's, um, the change is more related to your liabilities as opposed to your unfunded liabilities. Because it, it, you know, let's say you're 100% funded, you know, your liability is zero. So any change is gonna look like a very large change because it's gonna be, it's, it's gonna be a, you know, it's, you're gonna see that reflected 100% in your increase in um, unfunded liabilities. It's just gonna look like a large increase because you're starting with a low number. Um, you know, there, there's general rules of thumb. Um, I, um, in terms of how, how much um, your, your liabilities increase, if you, they're actually, if you look in the, um, the employer report, you don't even have to go to Outlook if you want. If you, if you look in your um, actual evaluation, we, we put sensitivity numbers in your report in terms of if we change the discount rate up or down, what impact would that have on your liability and your normal cost? Those numbers are already, are already sitting in your report. All you have to do is open up your report and you can get an estimate of um, what that impact would be. You know, it's the numbers are at 6%. Um, and and eight percent, we you know we we do a plus and minus one percent. If you wanted half, you know, say six and a half, you just take, you know, a quick estimate would be to take the six percent, take that difference and cut it in half. That'd be your six and a half discount rate impact on your normal cost. It would it's not exact, but it's it's a good approximation for for that. Um, that's probably the easiest way to kind of see the impact on um, your unfunded liability. Because it's it's basically just basically it'd be the increase in your accrued liability, and then we take that difference. If you wanted to impact on your contributions, um, our current policy right now twenty year amortization, so you'd amortize that over twenty years, and that'd be your corresponding increase in your contributions. 
All right, thank you, Scott. Uh, David, do you have any other questions? Yes, um, so this one would be probably best um, set towards Sterling. So this one, uh, it's kind of a long question, so I'll sort of summarize. Essentially, the, the question is, um, comparing CalPERS investment performance over the last, say, decade with um, the example given here is a, is a company called PARS, which administers OPEB trusts, which post-retirement healthcare investment trusts. And they cite that it had a, a 50% split with equities, 45 fixed income, 5% cash, and it has outperformed the CalPERS fund. So assuming that that is correct, I don't have the numbers in front of me. Um, what can we do in CalPERS to, to try to seek higher returns? Like, uh, I guess the, the base question would be, you know, you compare CalPERS to other um, portfolio mixes, we don't always come out on top. How much of that, you know, is, is just kind of based on how pension funds have to be arranged and what can we do to try to capture higher returns? So I think, uh, Dave, you actually hit on it. So a lot of it has to do with asset mix and what's actually happened, you know, over that period of time. And it's always a balancing act between over the long term, what you think will happen with asset classes as opposed to what actually happens over a short or medium term. The extreme example is that 15% over the last year, where you know if equities do exceptionally well, excuse me one second. <coughs> I muted myself, pause. So that's part of it. Um, so I guess in terms of what we, we can do um, about going forward in terms of ensuring good returns is, is exactly what we're doing right now, which is reviewing the asset mix um, and coming to grips with what we think the world is probable to deliver and preparing ourselves to take advantage of that. Um, I don't know if that answers all of the question, David, but was something more specific. I mean, without knowing the, the details, it's hard to do a one-to-one -one comparison and um, do an attribution of exactly what's going on. Right. <clears throat> okay, another question um, that just came in, maybe more towards Michael. So Michael, what do we expect, or, or Sterling, um, when we're talking about the CMAs, the capital market assumptions, we mentioned that we're gonna get we're, we're going to talk and, and be surveying external folks. We have our own board consultants. Can you just talk about that process more? Like what will the investment office of CalPERS be producing versus what we can expect to be getting from Wilshire and other you know, external entities? And then how do we present that to the board for consideration? Right. So there, there are different ways of, of developing CMAs. Um, an example is inflation. Some people might look at real return bonds. And from that, you can get an implied level of inflation for the next period of time. Other people will use sort of a fundamental analysis. Um, and I guess the important thing for us is having you know, looked at the, uh, this, the, the managers we deal with, they use a variety of different ways. And so there is variability um, for ourselves we start with a fundamental analysis. We have uh, third-party tools and in-house tools that help us think about economic growth and inflation over the next 15, 20, or 30 years and ask ourselves, what are the implications of th that economy in terms of what the returns will be? Um, we also have to think about current valuations. If valuations today are very high, then that tends to shave off returns in the future. So. So it's a very detailed process. It requires, it involves a lot of different people um, and different perspectives. So, you know, diverse perspectives are also important. We don't want group think. Um, and it, in my mind, it's always reassuring when people who use sort of very different perspectives arrive at similar outcomes. It kind of says that fundamentally, um, we're, we have a, a reasonable outlook on the world. Good, thank you. Um, another question came in. Um, is the amortization policy at all on the table during the asset liability management process? The change, recalling back to be changed from a 30 year amortization to 20, is that conversation sort of being reopened during the process? 
Um, no, there, there, there hasn't been any thought to um, looking at the amortization policy. Um, you know, as a reminder, the policy was changed um, with the forward looking to change in terms of impact. So for public agencies, they still haven't made a contribution yet with any amortization basis on the new policy. The first impact really is starting in 21, 22. And that, that's the first impact. So, so no one's kind of made any contribution so far under the new policy. And remember those, the, the policy um, is, was perspective only. So, you know, with, with, so only the most recent, you know, there's only one base that's affecting your contribution under the new policy. So if, if, all, if you had 20, 30 bases um, remaining on, in your amortization schedule, um, just one out of the, all, all your bases are based on a new policy. So the new policy is really not, hasn't really impacted contributions yet for, for, the, for most for the public agencies. All right, thanks, Scott. David, any more on your side? Yes, we had just one more that came in here. Um, and it's hearkening back to the question about implementation or, or possibly phasing in. So I know you talked about it already a little bit, Scott and Michael, but assuming that the discount rate were to be dropped any percentage, um, what would the timeline be for employers? When would they see that in their, say, valuations? Um, just what we, what we know as of today on that. Sure. So I'll I'll take that. Um, and we're 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 talking public agencies here. Um, you know, the state the state and schools has has. Um, I'll mention that at the end. But um, what we have is we have generally a two year delay between the valuation date and the fiscal year in which contributions are effective to allow the uh, employers you know, some lead time on, on, on any changes in the contribution rate. So any change um, that would happen this year, it would be reflected in the 630 2021 valuation. For public agencies, the 2021 valuation determines the 23, 24 contribution rate. So that's, that would be if there were no, nothing changed and, and that's, that's when um, you would see impacts for public agencies. It would be the 23, 24 fiscal year contribution rates. Um, for state and schools, it's one year less. They, they, they basically get a lot, uh, basically one year less lead time. So the, the, the 21 um, rates would affect the 22-23 fiscal year for the state and school plans. All right, thank you, Scott. So David and I aren't seeing any other uh, questions at the moment. However, if you leave this webinar and you have another question, please reach out to our stakeholder relations team. I'll ask them to put their general email in the chat box for you. I wanna thank uh, Sterling and Scott and Michael for their time today. And also thank you for taking some time to uh, listen to this webinar. We encourage you to, to follow this process. And uh, with that, have a good day.